Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. From Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Agnes Moorhead in Madame Claire on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Ladies and gentlemen, this is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize a novel by Susan Ertz called Madame Claire, the first and I think also one of the best novels of that very talented writer. There are some stories which, after you've read them, leave you with a sense of having met and known a very charming and civilized person. And Madame Claire is like that. Its warmth and urbanity won for it a large public when it was first written 30 years ago, and these qualities have also kept it alive and fresh. To star in the part of the delightful Madame Claire, we have most appropriately cast one of Broadway's finest actresses, well known to Hollywood also, Agnes Moorhead. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. And now Hallmark Playhouse presenting Susan Ertz's Madame Claire, starring Agnes Moorhead. Thames boats creep cautiously through the gray mists. In Trafalgar Square, cars and pedestrians appear suddenly out of the fog and then disappear again like so many hurrying ghosts. The fog of London is an old friend to Lady Gregory, or Madame Claire as she is known to her family. The fogs of almost 80 English winters have chilled her cheeks, but never her spirits. Her deep blue eyes still glow with an eager youthfulness. And this evening, there's a special glow as she sits at her writing desk. My dear old Stephen, nothing that has happened to me in the last 20 years has given me as much pleasure as your letter. After a silence a fifth of a century long, you have come alive for me again. You give me no explanation, and yet I understand. Certain things do not have to be said nor written. You ask for me to tell you all that has happened since we parted. No, Stephen, I do not live in the past. I prefer to talk of the present, of what I do here in my apartment, of the people who come to see me. Yes, I live in a hotel now. I sold the big house some years ago. I decided that my children and grandchildren should come to me of their free will rather than to put up with me through duty. And they do come, Stephen. Last evening, it was my son Eric and his wife. Eric was as charming and considerate as ever, perhaps too much so. Really, Claire, you must get out and about more. You've been staying in your rooms much too much. In other words, my dear, you find my conversation growing old-fashioned. Oh, now, Claire, I mean, well, to be perfectly frank, I'd like you to come to the House of Commons next week to hear my speech on the Reform Bill. I expect to be rather good. I'm sure you will be, Eric. 
just as your father was rather more than good when he spoke on the reform bills of his time. It's a pity how much reforming humanity requires just to keep its humanity. <laughs> I must remember to use that. <laughs> and after my speech, Claire, you'll come to the house for dinner. If Louise wants me to. My dear, you've been very quiet. You must have something to say. Should I? When Eric is here and can put it so much better, so much more brilliant. Oh, Louise. Oh, but he can. Eric's friends are always repeating to me some new proof of his charm. Another conquest by the man everybody admires. Oh, good heavens. I didn't realize the hour. We must be off. Yes. I'll get my coat. Eric. I'm terribly sorry, it's Mother. It's been growing for some time, hasn't it? Yes. That's why I wanted you to come to dinner. Perhaps if you and Louise could talk things no, no, out, I... No, no, Eric, I will not be a mother-in-law. But if I just knew what was wrong, I've asked Judy. She simply shakes her head and sighs, poor mother. Judy wouldn't know, my dear. She's your daughter and my granddaughter, yet there are times when I feel she's a complete stranger. Mm. It's really poor Judy. Oh, now, Claire, don't start that again. Uh, it's Louise who needs help. She needs you, Claire. You see, Stephen, another generation, but the same old familiar words. Someone needs me. Eric is so wrong about Louise, so brilliantly wrong. He can't see that his own brilliance is now defeating him. I am needed, and I shall help, but in my own way. Claire? Hmm? Didn't you hear me now? Oh, I'm sorry, Judy. I don't write many letters these days, and it takes all my concentration. Mm -hmm. Corresponding with an old lover, are you? A lover? Yes, but he's only 75. <laughs> it's Stephen DeLille. Madam Clay. Yes, the same Stephen who used to ride you around on his back and take you to Punch and Judy shows and trade you kisses for candy drops. Oh. <laughs> he's living on the Riviera now. Claire, after Grandfather died and you met Stephen, didn't you ever think of remarrying again? Yes, I did. Then why didn't you? Why did Stephen leave England and never come back? My dear, you promised to take me to the ballet this evening, and you promised we wouldn't meet the first girl. Oh, Claire, you're changing the subject. Because I want an additional promise, Judy, that you won't drive us madly through this fog. I'm old enough to go to my reward, but still young enough not to wish to collect it. <laughs> I'm very grateful to you. Why, my dear? For coming out with me on such a miserable night. For pretending to enjoy a very mediocre ballet. But I did enjoy it, Judy. And I think you might have, too, if you'd been with a young man. I should have been bored to tears. The more young men I see, the happier I am to stay a spinster. Oh, then you aren't meeting the right kind of men. They all talk the same way, do the same things, go to the same clubs. And want the same proper British marriage. Hmm. Oh, Claire, what's become of all the real men? The ones who dare to be different. Oh, the world is filled with them, Judy. But your father and mother don't intend to let one near you. You see, your parents also want you to have a proper British marriage. Bother this traffic. I'm going to cut up a side street. Judy, hmm? Judy, that man. Well, see. Oh, Judy. <laughs> It was not your fault, miss. He stepped right in front of you. Sir, are you hurt badly? Stroud? Stroud, are you there? I am, lad. Here, let me help you on your feet. Judy, <sighs> we'd better drive him to a hospital. No need for that, ma'am. I'm a doctor. I'll take him to his rooms and see what's needed. Well, then we're coming along. We'll take him in the car. You will let us do that much, won't you? I miss. I believe I will. I 
finally got him into bed. That's good. He'll be as good as new next week. Ah, but a few bad bruises and a bit of shock. Oh, thank heaven. Doctor, I'll give you my address so that you may send me your bill. For taking care of Drew? Yes. I'd not think of it, ma'am. This is the first chance I've had to repay Drew since he saved my life. Oh, did he? Aye, in the war. Drew and I were in the same regiment. Oh, but there is one thing you can do. Yes, what is that, Doctor? I'd like to run across to the chemists for some ointment and sedatives. Uh, I'd rather not leave them alone. Of course, of course. We'll stay here until you get back. Good. It's so like poor Drew not to keep anything on hand, whether it's medicine, food, or coal. Doctor. Aye? Uh, what is his last name? Crosby, ma'am. Crosby? Andrew Crosby. Uh, one of those writer chaps. Oh, Claire. Yes, my dear. He must be dreadfully poor. Yes. And a bachelor. Look. Two chairs, a reading lamp, a mm. desk. That's his sitting room. How can he stand it? Writers are not particularly concerned with furniture, Judy. It's their minds which are well furnished. Oh, Claire, look at this. Judy, put that it's back. It's only a photograph. He wouldn't mind. Oh, see. He's standing in front of... Some sort of oriental statue. Mm, so he writes and he travels. Oh. I didn't realize he had such nice eyes. The statue? <laughs> Seriously, Claire. Don't you think so? Mm. He looks rather shy. Mm. Almost apologetic. Uh, perhaps he is, my dear. For not saying the same things, doing the same things, going to the same clubs and wanting the same proper British marriage. <laughs> Really, my dear, it's no cause for alarm. I merely suggest that we should look in on my Mr. Crosby during his convalescence. Oh? And after that, perhaps I shall have him to tea one day. Oh, that'd be nice. I've always believed in tea parties. One of them led to a national revolution. This one might be more personal. <laughs> Here's Mr. Hilton with an important announcement from the makers of Hallmark Cards. And a very pleasant task it is. It's to announce the beginning this month of the second International Hallmark Art Award. The first such award was open to artists in only the United States and France. More than 10,000 artists of those two countries submitted paintings, and some of you had the opportunity of seeing the winning works at the Galerie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, the Wildenstein Gallery in New York, and at leading art galleries throughout the country. The second International Art Award is even broader in scope. It will be open to artists of all countries in North, Central and South America and also in Western Europe. The aims of the Hallmark Art Award are first to encourage fine art by providing a new and strong incentive for its creation. Second, to bring contemporary recognition and prestige to the most talented artists of today, both known and unknown. And third, to stimulate public appreciation of fine arts by providing an ever-widening audience. For, as before, the finest of these paintings will be reproduced on Hallmark cards. So, if you are an artist or know an artist, whether or not he or she has ever received public recognition, you can perhaps help in the discovery of a new talent by writing to the Hallmark Playhouse, care of this station, or direct to the Wildenstein Galleries, New York City. And now, here is the second act of Madame Claire, starring Agnes Moorhead. If one were to ask Madame Claire the meaning of old age, she would merely reply with a laugh. For to Madame Claire, time and age were unimportant. People were her interest and her happiness, and frequently her concern. How much she could be concerned, only one person knew. He was Stephen DeLille. My dear Stephen, 
It was wonderful to read your latest letter, to relive through it the sights and sounds, the magical mood of the Riviera. Yes, I should love to see it all again with you. But can one really go back? I promised to tell you more about Judy and her writer friend, Andrew Crosby. He's fully recovered from the accident and I invited him to tea this afternoon. I asked him to bring along some of the things he's written. I'm afraid you may be terribly bored, Lady Gregory. You mustn't feel that you have to read my manuscript simply because you know me. Oh, I think it's an excellent reason, Mr. Crosby. <laughs> but why should I be bored? Do your publishers find you boring? I have no publishers. I've never submitted my work. My dear boy, you can't live on writings which you never sell. <laughs> no. But I live on the writings of other authors. Oh. I translate French and Italian books for the English market. Oh, I see. And yet somehow you manage to save enough to travel about the world. Well, I do what I can. There's so much to see, so many ideas to try to understand. Good. Very good. The shy adventurer. I beg your pardon? You are shy, and yet not weak. Judy's discovered that. Uh, Lady Gregory... Yes, she's talked to me about you. About your walks through the park, the poetry you've read to her, and the time she tried to teach you to dance. I'm not the dancing type, Lady Gregory. <laughs> I, I'm afraid I don't measure up to the other men, Miss Pendleton knows. Good again. Lady Gregory, your granddaughter is the only woman I have ever met who made me wish I were a rich man. Or a successful man. Not that she would consider me if I were. Have you told her that? Oh, no, no. I have no right to. I shouldn't have said this even to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You reminded me for a moment of someone else. It was a long time ago. Excuse me, my lady. Yes, Dawson. It's Mr. Pendleton to see you. Oh, good. Show him in, Dawson. Yes, my lady. Then I'll be going. Not yet, Mr. Crosby. It's time that you met my son. Well? Eric. Eric, this is Judy's friend, Andrew Crosby. Oh? Oh, yes. How do you do? I'm glad to know you, sir. Uh, my daughter must bring you around sometime. Related to the Hampshire Crosbys, I suppose? Uh, no, sir. Oh, and then perhaps the Crosbys of Eton? No, sir. I come from Aberdeen. Hmm. Aberdeen. My father was Graham Crosby, an explorer. He died in South America when I was a boy. Oh, really? Then you must belong to the Explorers Club. Eric, really? I'm not a member of any club, sir. Remarkable. Isn't it, Eric? Mr. Crosby, I hope you'll come to see me again. Thank you, Lady Gregory. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Mr. Crosby... I intend to read your manuscripts tonight. I know now that I'm going to like them. You're very kind, Lady Gregory. Goodbye. Claire, I hope you're not encouraging that young fellow. No, my dear. I think the difference in our ages is really too great. <laughs> oh, Mother. You know, you were very cool to him, Eric. I've never seen you so... so snobbish. Claire... I came to tell you that it's happened. Louise has left me. Oh. Yes, packed up and walked oh, out. Oh, I'm truly sorry, Eric. What's behind it all, Mother? I've been a good husband. I've been a success in the world. I've given Louise everything I could afford. Yet, we kept drifting farther apart. And now this. Isn't the answer obvious, my dear? No, I don't believe it. Nevertheless, it's true. Louise is in love with another man. You should have seen his face, Stephen. My proud, brilliant, self-assured son didn't understand my real meaning. Louise is in love with another man. The man Eric once was, simple and kind like Andrew Crosby. Was I cruel, Stephen? Yes, but for a purpose. My child, what has happened? Everything. Just as I was afraid it would. You mean Andrew? Last evening I asked him to the house. I wanted to give a little party so we could meet some of our friends. Drew didn't want 
to come because he said his clothes weren't good enough. And when he did show up, he was really frightened. Naturally. Some of our friends are quite terrifying. <laughs> Nothing went right. Drew wouldn't talk and he couldn't dance. And Ronnie Fairbanks paid too much attention to me. Mm -hmm. And everybody was so clever and brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, Drew just disappeared. And today he wrote you a note saying that he could never have any part in your life. And it came in the last mail. Mm -hmm. How did you know? Oh, times may change, my dear men and women, never. But your young man is right, Judy. He doesn't fit into the life you've known. But I don't want him to. I want to fit into his life. Oh, he must know I love him. But he's never said so much as a word. Of course, he thinks you're unattainable. The princess in the castle. Oh, no. Yes, and there you'll remain, my dear. The spinster princess. Unless... The... Excuse me, dear. Hello? Lady Gregory. Yes, Mr. Crosby. Oh. I'm leaving for Paris, Lady Gregory, but I couldn't go without thanking you for all your kindness. Mr. Crosby, where are you now? Victoria Station. Oh, uh, about my manuscripts. If you could send them on. Claire, Claire, where is he? Victoria Station. Victoria Station. Judy, are you willing to follow your heart wherever it is? Oh, yes, yes, Claire. And I'm going to ask your father to drive us to the station. He won't understand why, but he will later. <laughs> Somewhere, Claire. Oh, Father, you're certain this is the boat train to France. My dear girl, of course I'm certain. Judy. Where? Judy, over there. Where? Over there. Where? Right. Where? Oh, oh, yes, it is. Drew! Drew, wait! It's beyond me. With all the young fellows she could have, she chooses a chap without a penny. Yes, Eric, because he's the only man who really needs her. Oh, mm -hmm. can't you see? My dear, a woman has to be wanted. She must feel necessary or love dies. Then you think it's quite proper for your granddaughter to run after and a man? And why not? She's running to catch up with her heart. I wish that someone had told me to be as wise. Mother. Yes, my dear. Stephen DeLille took this same boat train to Paris while I waited at home for his proposal, which never came. <sighs> Claire, what's the matter? You're trembling. I feel a bit faint. Get the fresh air, the Mother. heat, I suppose. Oh, Eric. Mother! My dear Stephen, please, you must not worry about me. My health is improving. In fact, more rapidly than I intend to let others know. Especially Eric. He realizes now that no man is an island unto himself. First he lost Judy to another. Now he fears he may lose me. It has humbled him enough to realize his need for Louise and to bring her back to him. Claire. Stephen. I came as soon as I heard. Oh, Stephen. It's as though these 20 years had never passed. <laughs> They haven't, my dear, not for you. You're as lovely as ever. And uh, you don't look one bit ill to me. I was. But I'm afraid I dramatized it too much, and now I've brought you clear across Europe. I'm so glad you did, Claire. But if you'd be happier with another excuse, let's say I came for Judy's wedding next week. And I have a wedding present for Drew. His manuscripts. Yes. After you sent them to me, I mailed them to a friend of mine. He says Drew has great talent. Oh. And he's going to publish his novel. How wonderful, Stephen. <laughs> yes, I think that would be an excellent reason for your return. Claire, I can't tell you how much your letters have meant to me. I understand now how you really felt about me. I was too stupid then to realize. Ah, oh, Claire, if only you'd given me one little sign. I know, I know, my dear. We were both so foolish. I, I told myself I was too old. Oh. 
Can you imagine that, Stephen? I was middle-aged. I had a grown son who might not understand. It was too late to love again. Never, Claire, never. Marriage is not necessary for companionship, and we'll have that. Yes, yes, my dear. Oh, we have so much to talk about. If people only knew the happiness of what they pity as old age. It's standing on the mountain top and looking back into the valley of life at our joys and what we thought were our heartbreaks. The mountain top is the best of all, my dear, for it shines in the last full rays of the sun. Oh, it's been so worth the climb, hasn't it, Stephen? Moorhead and James Hilton will return in a moment. We often describe the stores where you buy Hallmark cards as fine stores. They are. You'll find them always eager to help you in any way. For instance, right now, these stores have a gift for you, one I'm sure you'll enjoy and use over and over during the coming year. It's the Hallmark date book for 1952. In it, you'll find every day of 1952 arranged in calendar form with plenty of space for writing in the names of friends you want to remember on that date. No more forgetting birthdays and anniversaries with this convenient little book acting as your social secretary. There are separate pages for names and addresses of all your friends, a good way to keep your Christmas card list, as well as other information you'll find useful. You'll surely want this 1952 date book, and the store where you buy Hallmark cards will gladly give you one. It's his present to you, for friendship's sake. Here again is James Hilton. Whenever you see the name of Agnes Moorhead in the cast, you can always be sure of an outstanding performance, and tonight we had just that. Thank you, Agnes, for being with us on the Hallmark Playhouse. I enjoyed being here so much, Jimmy. You know, that's really exciting news you told us about, the announcement that Hallmark Cards will sponsor a second International Hallmark Art Award. I remember seeing the first exhibit when it was on tour, and I thought at the time that American business can and does foster the growth of all the arts in our country. And that's good for all of us. We feel that way too, Agnes, and are happy to be part of it. Jimmy, uh, what are you going to do on Hallmark Playhouse next week? Next week, our story will be about the life of the great naturalist John James Audubon. And we shall base our dramatization on the book by Donald Calross Petey, Singing in the Wilderness. And as our star, we are happy to welcome to the Hallmark Playhouse on his return to Hollywood, that popular French actor, Jean-Pierre Aumont. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying, Good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Agnes Moorhead may currently be seen in the Wald Krasna RKO production, The Blue Veil. The role of Judy tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle, and Whitfield Connor was Andrew. Others in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Edgar Barrier, and Ted DeCorsia. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Jean-Pierre Aumont in Donald Colross Petey's Singing in the Wilderness. And the week following, Charles Kingsley's Westward Ho, starring Joseph Cotton. And the week after that, Jane Austen's Persuasion on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is KMB 
NBC, Kansas City, Missouri.